Welcome back, Defenders. Jake here. Top story the last two days has been incredible. Double shoot down of Russian spy and command aircraft. Expensive losses, but still plenty of questions. Over the last two days, there's been a lot of confusion. What brought down these Russian aircraft? But I think we have the full story now. And Ukraine shot down these Russian aircraft. An A-50 went down in the water in the Sea of Azov. An Aleutian-22 took damage and was forced to make an emergency landing back in Russia. And here is a rare confirmation, rare statement from General Zaluzny. He states this. The Air Force of Ukraine destroyed an enemy A-50 long-range radar detection aircraft and an Aleutian-22 airborne control center. I thank the Air Force for the perfectly planned and executed operation in the Azov Sea. What brought down these aircraft? And it is possible that a Patriot launcher was brought right up to the front lines. And if these Russian planes were flying near Berdansk or the Ukrainian coastline to the Sea of Azov, then they are in range of a Patriot launcher. Otherwise, this was a Ukrainian jet that successfully launched some type of air-to-air -air missile, and the Russians didn't see it coming. And this plane, the A-50, uh, is a very important plane. Base cost, $330 million. Depending on the equipment it had inside and the modifications made, this plane might have been worth up to $500 million. And it's gone. It's now at the bottom of the Sea of Azov. The Aleutian 22, which also took damage, was forced to f make an emergency landing here in Anapa. And Ukraine actually intercepted the distress call from the Aleutian 22 to the Russian ground control. Here's, here's the call. urgently requesting an ambulance and a fire crew. And this is the only visual evidence of the damage to the Aleutian 22. This picture was geolocated to the airfield in Anapa. So this looks legit. And what happens with these air-to-air -air missiles is they don't actually make impact with the plane and then detonate. They detonate just before hitting the plane in order to maximize the amount of shrapnel going everywhere. So this plane was hit. The missile hit its target, but maybe uh, the explosion in the air didn't sustain enough damage to bring down the plane, but this plane looks pretty effed. Look at all the holes in the stabilizer and the tail section, and we can't even see the rest of the plane. We don't know how bad it is, but I'm guessing this plane isn't going to be flying anytime soon. Additionally, we have confirmation from a pro-Russian telegram channel. This is Fighter Bomber, stating that, yes, Russia took losses. A tragedy is always a tragedy, especially when it's of this scale. Whoever is there, we most likely will not know who is to blame for the death of these pilots. To the dead of eternal flight, to the wounded, a speedy recovery, and return to duty. He ends this post by saying, it definitely won't get any worse. No, Russia, I think it can get worse. And I can't overstate how important this plane was to the Russian Air Force. The Russian A-50 is a Soviet airborne early warning and control aircraft, an AWAC. And the Soviet Union only made about 10 of these planes. And in today's Russian Air Force, it's estimated that only five are still operational. And they need these planes to go to war. Think about how large Russia is. If they only had five of these planes operational, and they've got to cover the Arctic, the Pacific, the Baltics, the Caspian, the Mediterranean, these planes fly almost continuously. They're so valuable to the Russian Air Force. 
The personnel on board is a 15-man crew. And these aren't conscripts. These are officers. These are highly skilled, highly trained personnel. And a general doesn't always have to be on board. But I guarantee you, in the war zone, in the Sea of Azov, Russia definitely had a general on board this plane at the time it was shot down. Russia's never going to give that confirmation of which general lost their life, but I guarantee you there were some serious officers, some serious brass, on this plane when it went down. And the A-50s are extremely low-density, high-demand assets. From their perch high up in the flight levels, they provide a look-down air picture that reaches deep into Ukrainian-controlled territory. They can play a key role in spotting incoming cruise missiles and drone attacks, as well as low-flying fighter sorties. They also provide command and control and situational awareness for Russian fighters and surface-to-air missile batteries. This plane is the glue that holds together Russia's air force and air defense systems. It's the early warning radar to detect cruise missiles and enemy jets, and it's gone, all gone. And here's some interesting analysis from Ukrainian military strategist Alexei uh, Koptiko. Here's what he says. The incident with the A-50 and Aleutian-22 aircraft over the Azov Sea is similar to the destruction of the Moskva cruiser in terms of degree of comprehensive damage. The Moskva was the flagship for the Black Sea Fleet, and this AWAC system is the command and control for all planes in the sky fighting over Ukraine. Now Russia is taking desperate measures to downplay the significance of what happened, but it only confirms that something really painful took place. Russian media are actively spreading the message. The incident, as a result of which are unique, was due to friendly fire. The Russian propaganda narrative is that this war is already over. All the bots in the comments section are spamming me. The war is already over. So if the war is over, how is Ukraine able to shoot down this command and control plane? And this conflicts with their narrative. So the Russians are actually spreading disinformation that they shot down their own planes because they think that is preferable to admitting that Ukraine still has these capabilities. The friendly fire version is thrown as the least evil option for the Russians to tell their own soldiers. The Kremlin cannot allow the Russians to think about Ukraine's ability to shoot down scarce airplanes deep behind the front lines because this would have a strong demoralizing effect, especially on the occupation troops in Kherson and Zaporizhia. Technical failure as well as military negligence is an organic explanation for Russia's losses. Every day, all day, the Russians are going to lie and say, mechanical failure or we're incompetent. They're never going to admit that Ukraine is still fighting this war, in fact, Ukraine is going to win this war because the Russians are corrupt and incompetent. So I can only imagine how this meeting went between Putin and Shoigu. Putin asking, where's my $500 million plane? Shoigu responding, it sank. One of these A-50s costs the same as six F-35 fighter jets. Here's the weather map. To me, this is the war map now. I check this every day. And it's slightly warmer in Moscow today, only negative 3 degrees uh, Celsius, but that's still freezing. And the pictures and videos of utility failures across Russia on social media right now are endless. Let me share a couple clips with you. I thought this one was pretty interesting. <laughs> Я даже за них представить, что там. Походу и наш черед остаться без водички-то. Посидели мясок с водой и хватит. Помнишь, я этого не делала. 
This woman's trying to get into her apartment building, and when she opens the front door, six inches of water comes flooding out. We've been talking about this in my last two videos. What explains this series of utility disasters across Russia? Multiple reasons, but all the most competent workers to fix all of these pipes and electrical systems, they've all been mobilized and sent to Ukraine. They don't have enough competent people in these domestic cities to keep the heat on. And Russia is centralized with their heating systems. They have central heating plants that feed pipes all over the city. It's not just a single boiler room in the basement of these apartment buildings that can be repaired. This is citywide, infecting uh, entire blocks when one heating plant has a pipe burst. And the videos are endless. This clip is three and a half minutes. I'll link the whole thing down below if you want to watch it. But let me share with you a minute of this montage of ordinary Russians furious that they don't have running water, they don't have heat, or they don't have electricity in their, in their apartment buildings. That's полный, полный Египет. Вот и все, затопило все они. Они говорят, у нас никакой информации нет, не может быть, просто сбавлены немножко параметры. Я говорю, какие параметры, все остыло. То, что разрушалось в течение 20 лет, за один-два дня... What has been getting ruined for 20 years under Putin, you won't be able to fix in one or two days. For all these pipes bursting in these apartment buildings because of the cold, you've got to rip out walls. You've got to rip out drywall in order to fix these pipes. None of these apartment buildings are getting their heat restored uh, until it warms up, until April, May, or even June. Look at this mailbox. This is a person filming uh, the entranceway to their apartment building. How do you even deliver mail when your mailbox is frozen shut and covered in ice? I'll link this clip down below. Here's a man who shows his apartment how it basically changes in the cold. When you haven't had heat in your entire building for two weeks, frost just starts building up everywhere as your breath gives off moisture, it condenses and then freezes to the walls in your own apartment. Here's a compilation showing Putin uh, not caring about his people. So one of Putin's favorite talking points recently is saying the Russian military needs a breakthrough. So what somebody did online is uh, cut up these clips of Putin talking with the background of his people complaining about all the utility failures. Нам нужно осуществить, я говорил об этом не случайно в послании, прорыв. Это прорыв, с другой стороны, стадиона. Вода прям плещет. Ну, говорил о, о необходимости прорыва. Прорыв в будущее. Если мы не сделаем этот прорыв, в этом все, вся суть. Я уже говорил об этом много раз, хочу повторить. Нам нужен прорыв. Коротко ситуация. Нужно добиться прорыва, именно прорыва. Нам необходим настоящий прорыв. Замерзаем! Замерзаем! We are freezing, we are freezing, we are freezing. Alcohol dependency in Russia increases for the first time in a decade. In the decade between 2010 and 2021, first-time alcohol use disorder diagnoses declined from 153,000 to 53,000. 
But last year, in 2022, doctors issued 54,000 first-time diagnoses of alcohol use disorder. It's increasing. I'm, I'm shocked. I can't imagine a reason why Russians would feel the need to drink more. Russia's mobilizing about 30,000 soldiers every month. 30,000 soldiers a month is about 1,000 soldiers a day. And if you look at Ukraine's claimed losses, Russia's losing about 1,000 soldiers a day. So the Russian military has found this balance, regenerating every day in new contracts and conscripts, the same number that they're losing to keep the balance of power where it currently is. The main factor motivating men to join the Russian military is the pay. This is according to Ukraine's military intelligence. And while the salary level may vary, those fighting in Ukraine make between 220,000 and 250,000 rubles a month, or about 1,700 to 1,900 US dollars. And while we do see Russian wives filming these videos, wanting their husbands back, there might be a greater number of Russian women, Russian wives, who encourage their husbands to join the military. It's the women and kids back home collecting the checks. Plus, they don't have to see their Russian husbands anymore. But is it worth it? Is it worth it? And here's an article headline, just when you think Russia can't get any lower. Russian conscripts stripped naked, thrown into a pit, and ordered to have sex with each other. There's a video. I've watched the video. This is who the Russians are. If you don't want to participate in a meat assault, if you refuse orders, if your commander just doesn't like you, they can strip you naked in the dead of winter, throw you in a pit, and then at gunpoint, tell you that you have to have sex with each other, otherwise you'll be shot. I'll link, I'll link the video down below, but this unspeakable evil has to be stopped. How do the Russians get any lower than this? Visual evidence. Proving it. There is no dispute. This is who the Russians are. So let's check in on Russia's allies. North Korea. According to military intelligence, North Korea is supplying 122mm and 152mm shells to the Russians. The problem for the Russians is the quality of these munitions are pretty poor, and Russian soldiers on the front lines are complaining. So here's an example. Let me show you the game of Russian mortar roulette, where these two uh, Russian mortar specialists are trying to use North Korean artillery. Let me play this clip. It will be sped up at certain points in order just to move things along.
Сход. Пошел еще. Возьми. Сейчас, сейчас, сейчас. The quality of these North Korean shells are absolute garbage. But let's say the failure rate is 50%. If North Korea sends the Russians 1 million shells and half of them fail, well, then the Russians got 500,000 artillery shells. I don't think they're going to complain when they have no other options. They can't meet the demands of the military from domestic production alone. It's crazy. Let's get to the good news for Ukraine. And Zelensky just says, good news on air defense systems to come soon. Zelensky did not elaborate on the comment, likely alluding to Ukraine receiving more air defense systems in the near future. And that could be what happened to these Russian planes. Ukraine got another Patriot air launcher, and Ukraine is no longer announcing what they received. They don't want to advertise this to the Russians. Initially, they were announcing the delivery of these systems to give comfort to their people, that civilian cities would be protected. But as more air defense systems arrive, Ukraine's not announcing it anymore. They're not telling the Russians or the public how many of these systems they currently have protecting their cities and now fighting on the front lines. Switzerland plans to allocate $1.7 billion for Ukraine's recovery. Thank you so much, Switzerland. Final couple of clips I have for you. One is from the Superhuman Center. This is a nonprofit helping Ukrainian veterans with their rehabilitation after injuries. And I just want to share this video of a Ukrainian defender uh, getting in the pool. Looks like a nice rehab facility. Final clip I have for you is from Maria Abdiva. She was in the Kharkiv metro station and stumbled upon a random folk ensemble trying to keep the old Ukrainian traditions alive. Keep the old traditions alive. That's all for this update video. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support the channel. Comments and questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, keep defending the truth, keep defending democracy.